Good evening. Welcome to Back to What? Coping Strategies for success, to Successfully Manage the Transition Back to School. I'm Kelly Henderson with Form Families Forward. We're thrilled with your joining us tonight. And Nita, I'm going to let you get us started. Hi, welcome. We're going to talk about some ways to manage that transition back to school tonight. And Nina, I have the privilege of introducing um, uh, Ebony Thompson, our co-presenter this evening. Ebony is a biological mother and kind-hearted and gifted, excuse me, of a kind-hearted and gifted 15-year-old son who is very involved in future farmers of America, as well as gaming and development and astrophysics. She has been a licensed therapeutic foster and adoptive parent for a private organization for eight years and has fostered kiddos from ages three to 18, with her specialty being teenage girls. As a seasoned professional in the therapeutic community for over 17 years, Ebony has managed and mentored teen mothers in residential homes and within the community, mentors college-aged teens and young ladies that have aged out of foster care through their educational journey, has created safe spaces for families to discuss their foster adoptive experiences and received uh, positive support, provides support and respite for children and families in the autism or newer neurodivergent community and promotes healthy professional and personal growth for youth through career progressing, resume building, mock interviews, and professional exposure. Ebony believes that our youth have the opportunity and intellectual ability to shape our future into realities that they have yet to fully, amana, fully imagine. And it's our responsibility as mentors to provide the foundations needed for their academic, professional, and emotional growth and success. Nina, I'm gonna give you a chance to introduce yourself and I'm going to just uh, start in advancing slides as you do so. Okay, my name is Nina Manganeras and I'm delighted to be here with Ebony and glad that you all could join us. I am the Deputy Director for Formed Families Forward. I, I am a licensed clinical social work with probably over 30 years of practice under my belt, uh, primarily working supporting families to help them be the best they can be. I've worked with foster, adoptive, kinship care families in a variety of settings, both public, private, for the government, um, many school systems to support them. So I am delighted to be here and really looking forward to talking to you all about how to manage that transition. And hopefully you walk away with a few tips and things to make the school year go a little smoother. So Kelly, tell us a little about Form Families Forward. I will do that. But first I want to introduce Lisa Matthew, who is our training oh, and course. administrative coordinator, who is also uh, here with us tonight. Lisa, are we face are we on Facebook Live? I would like to say yes, but there appears to be another technical glitch. I am okay. working on it. Okay. And hopefully we will soon. So those who are waiting, cross right. your fingers. All right. I was going to greet our, our Facebook Live folks, but um, maybe we will do that a little bit later. So I uh, thank you for all of you who joined us through GoToWebinar. Um, I just want to say a little on the housekeeping part of GoToWebinar because it may not be as familiar um, to you as Zoom, and that is there's a dashboard of pods uh, probably on the right-hand side of your screen, little grayish, bluish bars. Um, one of those bars is questions, and that is your opportunity to chat in and let us know what you think. Nina and Ebony may be asking you some questions. Um, there'll be some polls along the way, which you'll just answer straight on your on your screen. Uh, but that question pod is really your way to communicate with us. Let us know if something's not working, if you're not hearing something, um, if you're not seeing something, let us know through that questions pod. Um, and we will talk now of just a smidge about Form Families Forward. If you are new to us, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. We are a family-led nonprofit. We work with foster, adoptive, and kinship families in Northern Virginia. We're raising children, youth, and young adults with special needs. Um, we also work with our professional friends. Uh, and we do our work through offering free of charge training, consultations, um, events, systems navigation. We have peer support groups. In fact, there's one tonight going on right now at our office, uh, peer support for parents and caregivers that are uh, in families led by foster adoptive kinship connections. Um, we also have a virtual group. We have an in-person 
uh, youth group that I'll talk about in just a moment. We have lots of videos and resources. Nina's email is there. Um, if you need to reach her or Ebony, please feel free to reach out to Nina at that address. And if you need a certificate for tonight's attendance, please reach out to Lisa Matthey um, at that address there at the bottom. And I will, um, we will chat that in as the night goes on again. So again, Nina is your um, link to both herself and to Ebony to answer any content questions after this evening. And Lisa is your point person for a certificate. I mentioned that we have a support group for youth and young adults, and I wanted to draw specific attention to that because we're still enrolling in that group. Um, we are midway through the group, but uh, it is an open enrollment group and a great opportunity for youth 14 to 22 years of age. It is in person in our offices on Fair in Fairfax on Tuesday nights. Um, so please um, give that a consideration if you are or you are raising a child um, or young adult in that age group who could benefit from some peer support. Those are led by clinicians. Um, and then we also have a teen group coming up for high school students that again is in person. It is in another place in Fairfax City, the Sherwood Community Center, and that is a seven week class and youth who participate can earn gift cards for participating and we also serve a dinner at both of those both of those events so learn more at formfamiliesforward.org and i'm going to turn it back to nina to share a little bit of our learning intentions all right thank you kelly thank you lisa so we are gonna our learning intentions for this evening are we're going to talk about common stress responses and how they impact school performance. We're gonna learn three mindfulness techniques to increase, increase resiliency. We're gonna explore some strategies to support academic success. And we're gonna develop a plan or talk about how to develop a plan to manage setbacks. We'll also discuss the transition, how the transition impacts children with special needs and specifically how it may affect foster, adoptive, and kinship families. Next slide, please. So we're back to school already. I was realizing today, what are we, a month in, Ebony? A little over a month, yes. So we're, we're kind of a little seasoned, but you know, there's a lot of, new things to come <laughs> yes and i'm thinking in some ways the honeymoon period is over the newness has worn off yes <laughs> transitions are always a challenge and for families and children going back to school it, going back to school is a big transition mm -hmm. it can include you know more, obviously more so for children with special needs it might include adjusting to a new teacher might include a new school um, for foster and adoptive children, they may be living with a new family, as well as adapting to a new school. For children who have providers in the school system, they may have a new provider. They may, again, be switching classes and they're just not familiar with the routine. So what you may see from your children, and those of you who are experiencing this are familiar with, you may see some challenging behaviors and some stress responses. Ebony, how's the tra the transition been going for your kids? I would say um, a pretty smooth transition. I know that a lot of people have been getting um, new kiddos in their homes, and I know that that can be a little frustrating, not really knowing where they are educational-wise, and not really knowing where their strengths are, and if there's any behavior issues that they should be keeping an eye out for. And with that in mind, I think that this is a good opportunity um, now that the kids have been in school for a little while to have that conversation with teachers and other staff that the children have been involved with to see if there have been any behaviors. Um, maybe some of the parents have received a little bit of feedback via a letter or a phone call. This is the perfect opportunity to have those conversations about getting any kind of testing done for behaviors, um, maybe implementing yeah, some kind of four plan or IEP, or just yeah. having a conversation about what might work best in the 
the actual classroom setting. Maybe there needs to be a quiet spot put into place. Maybe the child may need some kind of transition cards or any kind of breaks put into place. And having those types of things um, put into place usually helps kids with um, their transitions and allows for them to have peace of mind when they're in the classroom settings, especially when it's a new environment for them. And it's a new environment for them at the home as well. So right. a little bit. So of we may be talking multiple transitions: transition mm -hmm. to a home, transitioning to a new school. We might be seeing behaviors at school, and we might be seeing behaviors at home as well. Absolutely. Okay, I think we have a poll. Absolutely. Okay. So with the poll, I know a lot of things happen when it comes to behaviors that we see in our kiddos and either they're your biological kiddos, adoptive kiddos, or kids in foster care. Um, what happens is with some of the common behaviors, we may see things like crying, some type of anxiety, struggling with new rules and following directions, aggressive behaviors, trouble settling down, things like that. So. I want you all to look at this poll and kind of select some of the things that you've been seeing in your kiddos. And that way we can have an open discussion about what's been going on in your household. So we have the poll. It says it's distributing. Hopefully people can see. Oh, good. We are getting some responses now. So please take okay. a moment if you're in the audience to go ahead and click on the responses that um, are your most common behaviors that you're seeing. Thank you. More, more responses are coming in. We're going to give it about 30 more seconds. So please mark those that apply. And I see right now we're getting a little bit of crying and anxiety, um, trouble settling down for bedtime routines. Those are very common, especially beginning of the school year, everything's new. Everyone's trying to settle into some type of routine. So those are pretty normal. And I'm gonna give it about 10 more seconds. So uh, feel free to add your, com your uh, response and five, four, three, two, one, and hopefully you can see those results. Ebony, can you see them? I can see them. And it looks like we have half crying and anxiety and the other half trouble settling down for bedtime routines. Wonderful, so some so clear winners there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. yes. So, Next slide. Okay, I think it's really important when we're talking about behavior to mention, to take a moment to talk about trauma. We need to mention that almost universally foster, adoptive, and kinship care children have experienced trauma and loss. And as we look at a child's behavior and the family reactions, it's important to look at behavior through a trauma lens. That means just being aware of what this child has experienced. So being removed from your home, school, friends, and family is a trauma. And the reasons for removal may also include trauma. So that response, the trauma response, may pre present as behavioral issues. So what we're talking about is essentially all children's behavior is communication. And we need to take a look at, is this behavior the result of a trauma trigger, meaning something's reminded them of something that's happened in the past, or it's triggered a strong emotional reaction? Or is this a stress reaction to the transition? Or it may be a little bit of both. But trauma behaviors or, or trauma reactions, the goal of that behavior, we always look at what's the goal of the behavior. And the goal of a trauma response is safety. Your child is trying to feel safe. So take a look at what are they doing and what can we do to help them feel emotionally safe? And so thanks. Go ahead. 
I'm sorry, and I was just going to interject that it also it also looks very different with younger kiddos than it does with older. A lot of times our older kids have a tendency to hold things in and hide a lot of their emotions. And so it's hard to kind of tell what kind of, you know, behaviors you should be looking for. So that's just something to keep in mind. Just because you see no, like, um, obvious behaviors doesn't mean that there isn't trauma, trauma anxiety, and stress going on. Um, and so just a tip and something to kind of keep in mind for children, if you see a behavioral response that seems a little out of proportion to the situation, um, that may be a clue that it might be a trauma response. And I would encourage everyone here tonight, if you're interested in learning more about trauma, we have a series of three videos with accompanying fact sheets on our website. So I would encourage you to go ahead and, and check those out. All right, we're gonna start with the basics of what is stress and what does it do? Um, a st stress is essentially a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. Now that sounds like the start of school to me. <laughs> Sounds like starting a new routine, getting used to things, adapting to new environments, uh, getting used to different transitions. So what happens is when we're under stress, our body releases hormones that trigger a fight, flight, or freeze response. And again, out in the wild, that's very important. It helps us react quickly and protectively but it, sometimes it doesn't always adapt to real world situations. And stress may be a positive experience or a negative experience. It could be a fun thing, getting ready for a party, right? Can be stressful and it's in a positive way, but it can then also have a negative impact on us. So being called on, in class, I'm thinking of, you know, you're new in a classroom and you get called on class. It's a very stressful situation. Most definitely, public speaking is a big trigger for a lot of teenagers and older kiddos. And just to go into that a little bit more, meeting new friends, um, the anxiety that comes with that, the stress triggers that come with meeting new teachers, and um, just the thought of a heavy workload being um, put into a new environment, and now you have to deal with even more things to add onto your routine teen can be very stressful and triggering as well. Um, on top of that, for us as parents, looking at that and, and knowing that we have to help the kids through these transitions with school, but then we add appointments and meetings and things onto that as well are triggers that we have to look out for ourselves as well, making sure that we're managing those things. So those are just a few things, um, positive and negative, that um, I have ex been experiencing throughout the school year so far. And I know a lot of you all have been as well. So great very... examples, Ebony. Okay, we're gonna try and show a video. We were having some technical difficulties before, but this is a little video speaking to the stress response. I apologize. It seems that our captions are not in English, um, and I know the sound may be very low. Uh, if you are having any trouble with the sound, just chat in the questions box. Um, we'll, we have tried to do some troubleshooting, and it is um, uh, 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 seems to be a little bit of a, of a problem with the volume. I, I'm going to go ahead and just play it. Excuse the Korean um, closed captions. Hopefully, you can hear something. Um, let me just see if I can maybe. And I would encourage you to notice the graphics, though. I think even without volume and with Korean uh, translation, you can see <laughs> the, the impact. Yeah, stress is universal. <laughs> so we can look at the visual and kind of have an idea of what's going on.
And there's that fight, flight, freeze response that we talked about. And there's the school. <laughs> Okay, um, I am getting a message from one of our viewers that they're not able to see the presentation. Let, um, whoops. Kelly, I'm giving them, um, I'm communicating with them to try to resolve that issue for them. All right, so Lisa's working on that tech issue. If anybody else is having that same technology issue, uh, let us know. But you should be seeing a slide that says common stress reactions. If that is not the case, chat in again to the questions pod. All right. Nina. Okay. So as you could see in the video, um, there were some common stress reactions. The video highlighted anxiety as a common response. And as our poll reflected that it is a very common stress reaction. You may also see anger or irritability, difficulty concentrating, forgetfulness, depression, low mood, tearfulness, which was the other one checked, um, sleeping too much or too little, muscle, muscle aches or headaches, or withdrawal, just like Ebony said, sometimes teenagers, older children may keep it all inside. Yes, um, I know with myself, um, some of my stress reactions look a little bit like irritability, which may end up being a little yelling. I'm not proud of it, but I am human. I will admit, yes, I, I, I may yell a little bit, but sometimes I just need to just get it out in a loud way. <laughs> and I also um, have a tendency to deal with a little bit of forgetfulness. When I'm overwhelmed and I have a lot of things going on, I have a tendency to start forgetting things. And that looks like me making sure that I'm putting things into place, like reminders and alarms and things like that, so that I can get myself back, back on track. Um, some of the things that we have to think about, um, what are some of you all's stress reactions? What are some of the things that you all may have difficulties with when you're put into these stressful situations, whether with your kiddos, um, after you've dealt with a big blowout with your kiddos? Um, those are some things that you guys can put down in the chat um, so that we can just review and so that we can have an idea of some of the things that you all are going through when it comes to your stress reactions. So what are some of the stress reactions that you see your kids going through right now, whether they're older or younger, whether, you know, they're new to you or they've been someone that you had a while of experience with, that things change. Last year, your kiddo may have had an experience where their stress reactors look like them hitting. So that's some of the things that I experience a lot with my kiddos, especially at school. They they have a tendency to get a little physical because communication doesn't come out so easily when they're stressed out and overwhelmed. So that's one thing. And then avoidance. That I've noticed that that's something that I get a lot with my teenager. He likes to avoid situations when he's stressed out and overwhelmed. That looks like me having to come up to go up to him and say, "Hey, you know what's going on? Let's let's review what's what's been happening this week. Have you been going through some stress?" Sirs, um, you don't want to talk to me, which is a norm. When you're ready to talk to me, you can send it to me in a text. Um, we have family meetings where we can have conversations and rewind back to things that have happened throughout the week. So yeah. that's just a couple yeah. things that um, I've experienced and that I go through with some of the kiddos in my home. Anybody share any questions? Yes, we have um, have a couple of folks that are chatting in. Irritability and anger are some it's of the So are common. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. As you see, there's a, a wide range of stress responses. 
And most of the time when it's a stress response, it's pretty short lived. But if it continues on for a long time, it can have some detrimental effects. And I do just want to mention, we are just talking about commonplace stress reactions. Truly, if you mm -hmm. feel your child has an anxiety disorder or it may be a trauma response, maybe something as significant as PTSD, to please check in with your provider. Absolutely. So obviously we're gonna talk about impact on school performance. So when a child's having a stress response, or they're having a trauma response, the part of their brain that engages in thinking processes almost gets turned off. So they're not able to do things like follow directions, focus on a task, control their emotions and their behavior, adjust to different expectations in different environments, like going from school to home or class to class, and they have reduced problem solving. These are all things you need for academic performance. So if you can think about this, when we are asking a child to do an intellectual function, it's like asking them to do a backflip while doing an algebra equation. They just can't do it. That part of their brain isn't accessible. So we want to, we're going to talk about some ways to calm a child down, regulate them so that they can use that thinking part of their brain. Absolutely. Okay. If next. some of you are wondering if your kids are going through some of those things, believe me, the school will reach out and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. So what can we do? We've talked about some reactions, what may be going on at home, what behaviors we might be seeing. So we're gonna talk about some ways to strengthen routines, support transitions and manage stress. And these are tools for your toolkit. And these are not just for parents and caregivers, but get kids involved as well. So the basics of managing stress has to do with forming connections and relationships. So having that connection to your child, a biological child, foster kinship care, adoptive child, but you gotta build that relationship. And Absolutely. that is, will help counteract the effects of all, all the stress that's going on. So- and, 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 I'm sorry, I was ahead. gonna say, Connections and attachments are very important and they can be very hard as well. Um, it can look like you setting up a routine that look like maybe in the morning time, you guys doing some yoga to relieve any kind of anxiety or stress first thing in the morning, setting um, visual aids in the bathroom on the mirror maybe um, to show how to brush their teeth and do their proper hygiene. So it's something that they don't have to always think about. Um, establishing those attachments can be very small things. It could be a high five before they go out the door to go on the bus. So definitely- like you said, Ebony, they can take place in during those daily routines. Yeah, everybody has to brush Absolutely. their teeth, right? There's no reason it can't be fun and a connecting experience. Um, everybody's Absolutely. gotta eat, well, hopefully everybody's eating a little breakfast, but not always, but everybody's gotta get ready for school or work, right? go through mm -hmm. those routines. And so you can take those routines and make them fun, right? Just like you were saying, it may be something like doing yoga, or it may be singing a song or playing a silly game on the way to school. But Absolutely. each of those, they're building blocks, right? Each of those Absolutely. five minutes adds up to a nice connection. Absolutely. And there's a lot of resources on YouTube that you can just um, do a search on. And there's so many resources that will pop up to give you ideas for how to build those simple connections. That's a great resource. So we're going to talk briefly about emotional regulation and contagion. So uh, another skill that children and parents, caretakers need to develop is emotional regulation to counteract that stress. We talked about how we, we have stress, we have an emotional response and an emotional reaction. So we need to monitor or modulate that emotion and we have to manage how we experience it and how we express it. So when we teach children how to regulate, how to modulate, this can help them and it leads to a higher frustration tolerance, which means they can manage those feelings better and more resiliency that they can adapt more easily, that they can transition more easily. 
and they primarily learn through observation and modeling. So they see how we do it. If we're not managing our strong feelings, they're not going to get the skills they need to manage their feelings and modeling. Yes. Absolutely. I, I love that you put modeling and observation because with a lot of these kiddos, they haven't seen positive um, emotional regulations and contagion. They, they experience a lot of things that look negative to the rest of us, but to them, that's a norm. So modeling and giving examples of how they need to um, maybe breathe before they get to the point of no return or being able to go off to a corner and read a book. Um, maybe when you're getting upset and you're about to yell, you catch yourself and show them exaggerate. Well, whew, you know, I'm letting it all out. Let's have a conversation about this in five minutes because I need a timeout. And I think that you need some time to think about things as well. Just doing simple things like that mean the world to the kids. And a lot of times it's, it's very simple and it's things that you can place into your routine um, very smoothly. So it's just something to keep in mind. And I just wanted to highlight that concept of emotional contagion, just like you talked about, Ebony. If Children haven't been, they, they catch or contagion, they catch their feelings from us. So if they've been around a lot of negativity, if they've been around folks who didn't know how to manage their emotions and they, they catch it, whether it's unconscious or not. And so the more we can remain calm and show them how to manage things, they can catch that as well. Absolutely. So one technique to manage really strong feelings is called name it to tame it. And this is not my idea. This comes from Dr. Dan Siegel, who's a writer, psychiatrist, professor, and co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. But as he explained that when you're feeling a really big emotion, a high intense emotion, such as feeling scared or angry, your brain pumps those stress hormones that we've talked about, and it lights up the right side of your brain, the feeling side of your brain. And once this happens, again, we've talked about this, you're not able to get to your left side of your brain, your thinking part of your brain. So if, again, the emotion side is lit up and the thinking side isn't functioning, you're not able to do things, you're not able to function well academically, follow directions, problem solve like we talked about. So one way to counteract this is for us as parents to facilitate with, with our children or when we're caretakers, and we name it to tame it. So we notice the feeling. We see a child getting upset. It looks like you're getting angry. And then we label the feeling. And we encourage them to name the feeling, help them use a feelings vocabulary. That's why we chose this graphic with all the different facial expressions. By modeling, demonstrating, naming and taming, we help children identify what they're feeling and then name it. And then if you can name it, you're back on the left side of your brain, which helps calm you down, helps that regulation. And just reiterating with that name it and tame it and some of these other things we talk about, it, it's not gonna, it doesn't just roll off your tongue the first time. It's, it is a skill. These are techniques that we're talking about. So the more you practice them, the better you're gonna get at them. Right, Absolutely. Ebony? Absolutely. Um, like I stated earlier, making sure that you're having visual cues put into places where you know that your kiddos may be having difficulties in the morning. Um, I know that when the kiddos get up, that's a very hard time for them. Maybe putting into the routine um, a little bit of music, and then they can look over to the side and see their whole visual support, showing them how to correctly make up their Make it simple and short. Let's not put a whole six um, part list down. Make it three parts. You make sure your pillow's at the top. You make sure your blanket is all the way over and you bend it back just a little bit. And your bed is made. It can look um, like, 
like we stated earlier, brushing your teeth, having um, the breakdown of what it looks like to properly brush your teeth. And that can lead into a conversation where you all can do it together every once in a while. Maybe um, family brush Wednesdays. I don't know. <laughs> it's I, a I love the idea of having fun with it, Ebony. Absolutely. And it's things that um, can easily be put into place. And there's lots of resources um, that you can utilize. There's um, the special education resources um, that you can utilize from the schools. There's YouTube, there's Pinterest. There's lots of different resources. I was going to mention Pinterest for visual support has some great ideas. Absolutely. They can be photographs, they can be drawings, objects, words, lists. All of us have lists Absolutely. one way or another, right? Electronic or picture lists a lot of times for young children can be helpful. Absolutely. You know, you have a creative child, make it with them. Get some construction paper, get pictures of them. You know who they love to see the most? Themselves. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I will say a lot of times for kids on the autism spectrum, depending on, you know, their language uh, abilities, that picture visual cues can be very helpful. And Absolutely. Again, lists for children with ADHD, helping them get ready, ready for the day, get ready to go out the door. And, and a, a common visual cue that a lot of folks use is a family calendar. That's Absolutely. really a visual cue for the whole family. Absolutely. When kids are involved in the routines, when they're involved in these visual supports, they're more likely to do them. And that's the whole point, right? We want them to do it. So, hey, why not make it fun? Make it fun. Another technique is called a scripted story. And I would encourage you to, again, we talked about using the internet, YouTube, Pinterest, um, but the um, uh, National Center for P Pyramid Model Innovations, which this is from, it, the challengingbehaviors.org has a ton of scripted stories on their uh, website. But basically, it's a little story that outlines the routine. And the recommendations are you make it short and descriptive, you include each step in the routine, and you write it in first person. I will, when I, my family will. And just like Ebony said, kids love to see pictures of themselves or related to or pictures of their family or their friends or their pets. So that and personalizes it and makes it real. And I've noticed a lot of times with scripted stories, it kind of looks like a scripted song. <laughs> so that's another oh. fun way to do it as well. Hey, a lot of times through music, things are memorized easier, especially in young children. So that's a one way that we do utilize a lot when it comes to trauma. We, we use a lot of music and, and play and visualization. So just putting all that together really, really makes things flow easier for these kids. It really, and it, for you as well, because when your job is easier, everyone's happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Happier. Exactly. <laughs> A tried and true way to help manage transitions, routines, is to offer choices. So again, you can do this throughout the day, or if you know getting dressed is gonna be a challenge, or if you know eating dinner is gonna be a challenge, by allowing the child to pick and choose and, and have choices, you empower them a little bit. It gives them a little more control over their world. But just some tips, um, only offer two choices, otherwise it really gets too overwhelming and it, it, it bogs everything down. And make sure the options are reasonable and Absolutely. that they are available. Don't offer, you know, food or an outfit that you don't have. And you can offer those choices verbally, you know, by asking. But again, with young children, maybe you hold up the blue shorts or the green shorts, or you hold up the macaroni and cheese or the hamburger. And that may be easier for them to decide. And if you could honor their choice, be respectful of that and, and allow them to, to choose. Is this one you've feel. done? Ebony, have you done this with your children? Oh yes, but it looks a little different for me. What I like to do is to do a lot of these things over the weekend. 
I like to have that Monday, Tuesday through Friday kind of um, box all together. We've gone through all the choices. They know exactly what they want to wear. I might make a choice during the day impromptu kind of thing. Like, hey, what socks are you going to wear with this beautiful outfit you picked? Um, just to make the choices available to them um, kind of daily so that they still feel like they're a part of an everyday decision, which will help them with their coping and attachment skills as well. Um, but I like to do a lot of these things over the weekend. So if there are breakdowns, if it does lead to us having to come back to it, it's not going to impede on our time in the morning to make sure that we're out the door in time. So that planning is really helpful. Very much so. Very, very helpful. Okay, this one's called embedded preferences, which is the fancy way of using what your child likes. Use it to your advantage. So you can help them learn and follow routines by em embedding what they like. Um, for example, if your child doesn't like getting ready for school, but he likes to pretend he's a superhero. In the morning, you ask him what superhero does he want to be, and you call him by that name. You can buy clothes with the superhero on it, which may make getting dressed easier. So you can do different things. You can, an embedded preference may even be a person they prefer. If there's a sibling who they really enjoy spending time with, then, you know, Big Brother can help you get dressed this morning. Um, we all know okay. children have favorite objects. They may like matchbox cars. They may like action figures. They may like American Girl dolls, whatever the case may be. Um, but you use those to your advantage. You can pair those with something that needs to be done. So if they're going to do a visual chart, you know, uh, depending on the child, it, it can be a Little Mermaid chart. Mm -hmm. um, so build those into what you're trying to do or locations, you know, if they want to get dressed in the family room, that's okay. As long as it's agreed upon, obviously. <laughs> um, I love that. I love the idea of um, having charts and like, if you like the little mermaid, have little mermaids, they can put it up there when they've achieved different things throughout the day, throughout the week, so on and so forth. You know, I'm kind of interested in seeing what some of you all's preferences are. What are some of the interests that your child may have that you utilize within your routine and um, making sure that um, attachments are being met? Can you all put some of those in the chat so that we can have an idea of some of the things that you all have um, when it comes to your, your kiddos interest and their preferences. And while folks um, put those in the questions pod, um, I wanted to bring folks attention to the to the your chat box that you're seeing where Lisa has pasted the URL or the link to the video that some of you could not hear. Uh, so you, you can Lisa. Take a look at that um, and hopefully find your way to English subtitles if that works better for you. Um, uh, <laughs> captions. Uh, so that is a great video. The other thing I wanted to mention is we're going to uh, continue to drop in some links to some of the resources, the Forum Families Forum resources, and also the link to Lisa's email if you do need a certificate as the evening progresses. Um, so please go ahead and do chat in through the questions pod some ideas about how um, you are um, you are uh, embedding preferences, and um, we can we can uh, read those off as they come in. Um, I will share one, um, I don't have myself on camera, but I'll, there we go. Um, I'll share one that just came up today with my kiddo. Um, and he is very, very much interested in um, all things country and cowboy. Uh, so we were able to embed his preference for cowboy boots um, as, a, as a way of getting out the door to something we needed to do because he got to wear his special boots to get to this uh, task that wasn't maybe a preferred task, but he did prefer to wear his boots. So that was a that was an easy preference to incorporate. I'm taking a look to see if there's any others as they come in. I think clothes are a perfect example that you can embed a preference. Absolutely, and even with music, playing music in the morning, if you know your kid likes, um, a certain type of um, singer or 
um, song playing that will usually keep up motivation and have less, you know, tantrums and things in the morning as well. And even in the evening, if you know there's been a stressful time, maybe playing a little bit of jazz or classical music and like, you know, take down some of the tension that's happening. So just, you know, having an idea of different ways that you can address those things and embed those preferences, whether they know it's a preference or maybe it's your preference that you're going to pass on. <laughs> that you're going to no. share. Okay. Absolutely. Can you, can you go to the next slide, please? I can. And um, Lisa, while I do that, do you want to read some of the comments that came in on embedded preferences? Sure. Um, we have Star Wars is a big hit. Yeah. So a Yoda robe has been uh, our item of choice. Yoda is worn to breakfast and he is called Yoda while wearing it. Uh, the awesome. other comment that we have is um, my very picky eater loves dinos. So dino shaped nuggets make dinner time easier. And then we have letting them listen to preferred music while they shower or perform hygiene tasks before bedtime. That's great. That's why All you very great suggestions. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing. And I'll just Absolutely. share one other one I think that slipped through. Um, shapes. I let kids often pick what yes. shape they cut their food into. What a great idea. So round sandwiches versus triangle sandwiches. Great idea. Yep. 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 Triangles yep. or squares. We've done at our house. You have the little cookie cutters now, so you could do a little bit of everything. Oh, that's true. You could really get you could get a Yoda cookie cutter or a star. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, just touching base briefly on some additional tips, and we've already mentioned some of these, but what's, as much as you can, plan and prepare. Ebony was saying plan for the whole week, but organization, um, the strengthening those routines, developing, establishing, communicate with school staff, talk about feelings, develop that feelings vocabulary. And always allow ample time. You know that with, especially with young children, it always takes three times as long as you think it's going to. Um, except that transitions take time, both small and large, whether it's just um, moving from one room to the other or getting ready to go to school or work for the day. Um, establish a calming space. Uh, Ebony, you had also mentioned this, a quiet nook, either you know, a beanbag chair or weighted blankets are really popular now. It really helps us calm down. Um, and don't forget the basics for everybody. You know, try and get enough sleep. Try and eat regular meals. Uh, dropping blood sugar can lead to a lot of challenging behaviors, both from grown-ups and kids. And exercise okay. regularly, whatever that looks like for you. That may be just taking a little walk or getting your wiggles out, but move your body. And again, a strength that Ebony has highlighted is keeping a sense of humor. And Absolutely. remember, be kind to yourself and your children. It, it's We're all in this together, right? Just trying to get through. And remembering that on average, it takes about 90 days for a, in, people without trauma or any kind kind of um, issues to establish a common routine. So when you involve trauma and other things and anxiety, it's gonna take longer. So just having that empathy there is awesome as well. Just understanding that it's 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 pace. It's nothing's right. gonna and be- if you think about we're 30 days into it, right? So, Absolutely. you know, we're just getting our, we're finding our rhythm. Absolutely. Just wanted to mention encouraging statements. You, you get a lot more response by positive statements. But uh, things like, you know, observe what you've seen and then comment on it. You put everything in the toy box. Uh, wow, you did such a great job picking up your toys tonight. It's so much fun to play with you. You were being such a great helper when you helped me bring the groceries inside. Thank you for using your inside voice when your sister was sleeping. So, and, you know, just to uh, um, add on to this, those encouraging statements, if you can say them in front of someone, and certainly if you can say them in front of someone who's important to the child, and often if you do a little physical touch, if that works for the child, um, you know, wow, great job. You, Ebony, you mentioned high fives. 
Um, or if the child likes hugs, you know, wow, that's great, and give them a big hug to reinforce it. So frequently we are always telling children what we don't want them to do, and some days it feels like we're always saying, stop, don't, no. So if we can turn it around and tell children what we want them to do. So if the behavior is not listening, what we want them to do is follow directions. So then we say, thank you for listening and Asha, and thank you for putting your books away and give a hug. That's that positive statement reinforced with physical. So the behavior is yelling. We want them to use their indoor voice. Wow, Jaden, you are using an inside voice. You are such a big kid. And give a high five, reinforce it. But as much as we can, if we can tell them what we want them to do. Absolutely. And also taking that opportunity to also, if they say something, well, you yelled the other day, say, you know what, I was wrong. And I should have been able to not yell and use a, a quiet indoor voice as well. And I'm going to work on that too, because you know what, no one's perfect and I'm learning with you as well. And just admitting that you're not perfect and you're working on things with them gives them this sense of, okay, we're in this together. Right, and we're all working on it. And you're validating their feelings by when they, they share something with you. Absolutely. So again, consistency as much as you can. Keep day-to-day -day routines the same as close as possible. Help your child learn to follow the steps of the routine and share a sample of you know the visual schedule and how easy changes can be made so if you have a visual schedule if you can swap out a picture or draw a new one when there's a change it gives them information about what's coming up so transitions we've talked a bit about this already but you know going from one place to another they usually occur several times throughout the day they can be overwhelming or difficult for a child who's new to the home or new to the school. It's a lot. So mm -hmm. transitions are often decided when and how often are, they occur are usually decided by an adult. Um, so the more information we can give children, the better off they are. The more sense, remember we talked about safety and they need to feel emotionally safe. So if they know what to expect, they know what's coming next it can really reinforce that sense of emotional safety. Absolutely. So there are lots of transition cues. We've talked about, you know, visual pictures. There's your toothbrushing, Ebony. <laughs> I'm giving, you know, a prompt. So it can be, you can have your visual chart describing the whole routine, or you can just simply have a visual prompt if that's helpful, just to alert them, this is what we're gonna do. You can, for transitions, you can use a timer. You can set the timer to give them an awareness of, okay, we have you know five minutes left to play. And with the world of technology, you can set these transitions up on Alexas and Googles um, that will help out a lot as well, make your, out a profile and you can have those transitions placed at certain times throughout the day. That's an excellent idea. Use uh, technology to your advantage. And then it, it, sometimes too, it can disrupt a power struggle. It's not you telling them it's time, it's Alexa telling them it's time. Absolutely. Speak their love language, technology. Yes, <laughs> yes. So this is something called first then language. And I would imagine most parents and caretakers do this without even thinking about it. But Absolutely. it's saying first we do this, then we do that. So first we eat our breakfast, then we can go outside and play. You know, first we pick up the toys, then we can watch TV. Or it can even be simple. It could be first we get out of bed, then we turn around and we make it, which can be the start of the routine that they're supposed to be doing first thing in the morning. So I'm going to mention self-care and sometimes I do hear people groan when I mention self-care but it is important and it's a term that's thrown around a lot but really what we're talking about is you know that you can't pour from an empty cup. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not gonna have the time, the energy, or the emotional stamina to take care of anyone else. 
So Absolutely. again, start with the basics, sleep, eat, exercise, connect with others, art. This is, I'm not going to read the whole list, but there's a you know, variety of things. Figure out what works for you. And I know a lot of us don't have a lot of time, but Ebony and I were talking about this idea of, what are we calling it, micro, my, what was the phrase? Um, oh, I can't remember. Uh, micro care, it was the micro, micro care. care. Um, so with, I was having a discussion with Nina, and we were discussing how I like to do micro care in my car because I'm always on the go. I'm always going to meetings and appointments, work, whatever. So just taking those moments when I have them, whether it's five, 10, 15 minutes, and maybe listening to a favorite podcast or going and picking up my favorite drink in the morning, because I know that always starts me off in a good mood. Um, making sure that a lot of times when I'm ripping or running around, I don't have time to maybe eat or I skip a meal, making sure I have snacks that are available that are healthy that will also set me in a good mood as well. Just being able to um, have access to things that are immediate micro cares for me in my car have been a great lifesaver for me, especially having kids at different ages and having different schools and different appointments and different to do's all together. Um, it's something that I have implemented and it's worked very well for me. And it's something that I am going to continue to, you know, nitpick at and build up on as I see fit, but it's and just fine -tune. Mm -hmm. and fine tune as I see fit. And it's just my way of doing a micro care. And I like to call it my car care. <laughs> <laughs> my micro car care. I, I see we're, we're coming close to our time, but I briefly just want to talk about mindfulness which this is the definition, the practice of maintaining a non-judgmental state of heightened or complete awareness of one's thoughts, emotions, or experiences on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. But I think a simple way to view it is regulation. It's calming our system. And these are just four simple or three simple mindfulness activities one is called four by four breathing. That's simply breathing into the count of four, holding for four, letting go for four, holding for four, and repeating. And if four by four doesn't work for you, you can do three by three or two by two. It's just taking that breath. It's slowing yourself down to have that moment between reacting and responding buying yourself some time, regulating yourself. Another um, mindful activity is going for a mindful walk. Mm -hmm. That's just simply paying attention to what's around you. But Absolutely. you can do it differently. If you're walking with your child, you can point out all the things that are blue or all the, you know, um, how many cars can you see? It's just a way of focusing your attention. And this last one is using your five senses to ground yourself. And that's where you name five things you can see, four you can feel, three you can hear, two you can smell, and one you can taste. Now this is a great exercise to do before going to bed. It really calms you down, it can calm your child down, and it's also really helpful if anybody suffers from insomnia. Try it in the middle of the night and it really grounds you, regulates you. And if you really don't know where to start with mindfulness activities, there are many, many apps that can help you with that. And there's a lot of apps that are geared towards children as well. So just doing a quick app search will help with that as well. And then just to uh, give you some tips, we've talked about some of these, get to know your child's teachers, get involved with the school. Communicate regularly with the child and the school, whether that means regular emails or a communication notebook. Ask for help if you need it or you don't understand something, such as an IEP or a report. Develop a schedule. We've said that word over and over, a schedule, routine, um, but include regular homework time. Uh, the option of having a landing pad. So when everybody comes storming in at the end of the day, is there one place for backpacks, jackets, shoes, stuff to go? 
and as much as you can manage your stress, yours and your child, and build a community. Um, I know it's a cliche, but it does take a village. You need to get to know other parents, foster parents, teachers, neighbors, coworkers, whatever works. So as you're developing your expectations for your child, know what is reasonable. What are their limitations? Are they able to do this? So keep them realistic. And if you find yourself getting frustrated, then it's time to re-examine the routine. Mm -hmm. And finally, when things don't go according to plan and everybody knows they don't always go according to plan, take that breath, take a pause so that you can respond and not react. Identify what the issue is. Review what your original plan was and then laugh because it's that saying, you know, life is what happens when we're busy making other plans. Absolutely. And then you develop a new plan and ask for help. Something as simple as let somebody hold the door for you. Let somebody grab a meal for you. Let somebody help you out or ask them to. Pride is a dangerous thing in this game. You have to be able to know when to ask for help. You have to. So Ebony, wrap us up here. Absolutely. So what does this all look like? Overall, you need to be able to celebrate when things go well. <laughs> Some of the things I like to do when I'm celebrating when things go well is a quick high five. We did a good job. I'm so proud of you. Uh, making sure that I'm, I'm, I'm making those little celebrations just as big as the big celebrations means a lot to these kiddos, especially when they have so much going on. Just that, hey, you know what? Today at school, I got no negative reports. I'm so proud of you. You, you, you don't understand how much that means to the child when you're celebrating the little wins, when things go well. Hey, you know what? We got out the door, no tantrums, yay! You could do a little dance, a little jig, say, hey, here's your sticker. Put it right there on their chest. It's probably a Baby Yoda sticker for the people who are in the <laughs> But you know, celebrations are great. And I would love to hear what some of you all do when it comes to the little celebrations that you put into place when things go well. What are some things that keep your kids going, that keeps the routine put in place, some things that keep you sane? <laughs> when there's so many things going on and you feel so overwhelmed, but you know what? We got this done. They made up their bed. Yay! And it was such a hard struggle for you. And it happened and you, you're celebrating. What do those celebrations look like for you guys? I would love to know. So feel free to go ahead and chat those in in the questions pod. We will we will be looking for them. We are a little bit over time, and I do want to honor folks' um, bedtime commitments. So Lisa has placed in the chat box the link to the evaluation for tonight. It really does help us improve our services. Um, we so appreciate Ebony's time and energy and expertise. Um, such such valuable tips um i it's so refreshing to have you join us ebony so thank you for doing thank that you, thank you for having me i'm so honored this was so great <laughs> uh nina do you have any closing words as folks complete that evaluation again in the chat box if you could uh click on that link it's not long but we do appreciate it nina uh, no just to thank everybody for their time i know how busy everybody is especially this back to school time and i hope you found some of the information helpful um, as the slide says, stay in touch. Don't hesitate to reach out. And we have a ton of resources. Take advantage of them and please complete the evaluation. And like it was stated earlier, if anyone's interested in, um, you know, getting to um, get any information from me or having a powwow with me or having a discussion, please um, get in touch with Nina and she will email me and let me know what your information is. And I will be so excited to get back in touch with you. That's great. And as we wrap up, we have one, one last comment coming into the comment back. Lisa, do you want to share that? 
Sure. Uh, we had a participant share that their kids got a star for each day that they behaved. After 10 stars, they took they were taken to the Dollar Tree to pick something out. So That's that great. sounds like That's a lot great. of fun. Absolutely. Oh, love it. Haven't lost their magic. <laughs> Absolutely. And the Dollar Tree has a lot of nice stickers too. If they get tired of the stars. All righty. Well, we wish everyone a, a wonderful and um, and uh, uh, safe good evening and a, a happy, happy uh, school year with lots and lots of successes and lots of these strategies applied uh, to great success. So uh, once again, thank you. We will um, uh, look forward to your feedback and the evaluation and hope to see you in another webinar or class or uh, training or consultation soon. Nina and Ebony, again, thank you so much for your, your wonderful content. Good night, Our everyone. pleasure. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Ebony, you rocked it.